Chopin's Opus 64 contains three waltzes. The first one is the famous minute waltz, or the minute waltz, and the second one is this lovely C-sharp minor waltz. And they're written very late in Chopin's life, in 1847, but they're not really the same late style if you compare it to other works from the same time. For example, the Barcarolle Opus 60, or the Polonaise Fantasy Opus 61, the Nocturnes, Op. 62, or the Cello Sonata, Op. 65. Those works are generally richer in counterpoint and more exploratory harmonically. These waltzes are more like he's taking a step back to a more simple and clear idea with the waltz as the essence. And this in C sharp minor, it's also full of, as someone put it so beautifully, the veiled melancholy that is typical of Chopin. So this piece has three sections that it alternates between. The first is in C-sharp minor, it's a little bit slower compared to the next section that is faster. But tempo giusto, it means like in exact time or in strict time. And it's quite ironic because you would like to play this with quite a lot of rubato because it's so permissive of rubato, like... So it's not at all in strict tempo. So I think the meaning is more like you should find the right tempo, not too fast and not too slow. That kind of tempo giusto in this context. And in the melody we have these clear building blocks. It's two bars at a time, statement and answer type of construction. And we have this duality of like a more introverted and reflective feeling of the first statement with these long notes, like thinking notes. And then the answer uh, is more playful and like the waltz is bubbling up. And again, statement, pause and think, and waltz. And then after four statements like that, we get a little bit of new energy. First is this tension. It's a diminished chord. It's a D sharp seven with an A, it's a minus nine. It's a lot of tension in that chord resolved. So the melody starts to go up. Uh, the first four statement it has go been going down. All the time falling down and then the melodic direction starts to go up. Um, like bursts out in emotion like this with a chromatic size, the psi motif uh, with two notes like that, just consecutive size. And back to C sharp minor. And the harmony here is just an extended cadence with the D sharp 6 4, D sharp 7, that's the dominant to D sharp. 7 that's the dominant to C sharp minor so cadence like that so then we get the same melody again but now so this takes a different turn in the first time we go to C sharp minor and in the second time, it's E sharp is C sharp major. And now we get to sail on the circle of fifth for some time, the left hand. With a, a dominant chord, chords. Kind of bluesy, but then of course the Chopin melody on top. With the major we get a little bit hopeful when we get here but then 
in the end it didn't work out, it goes back to minor. You can do a lot of rubato here, I think. Almost die, but then the music continues and now we reach the second section. This piumoso, it's faster and it's a complete change of texture, the right hand plays uh, eighth notes, continuing movement of eighth notes. And we get the lovely theme of the waltz. So these eighth notes is like a spinning wheel that starts to turn and it goes around and around and it never stops. And Chopin is such a master of finding these textures with uh, quick eighth notes or sixteenth notes that just keeps on going. Uh, he does it also in the Fantasy Impromptu. There it goes upward. Here it's like more downward motion, but Fantasy Impromptu. And there's also in a, the third piano sonata, in the finale, the last movement, uh, in the middle, like a transitional theme, he finds this really high-paced um, whirling feeling. The whirling is the best word I can find for it. So, in, like, uh, after a while we get this. I haven't practiced that, but it's just great music. Anyway, back to the waltz. The phrase structure here is very even. You have an even number of bars all the time, and this is true to the style of the waltz. Uh, it should be predictable enough so that you can dance to it. Even though this music is not meant for the ballroom, it's meant only as music to listen to. But that's still part of the style. Uh, you have these like bars of two and four together. It's the same in the Baroque dances of Bach, uh, very even number. With the phrases. But here we have these eight bars statements, starts like this. And it goes back up and uh, we get the same again. It starts the same and four bars. But then it closes in a different way with this lovely scale reaching up to heaven. And that's two times eight bars. Now we get an exact repeat of that. Uh, and here it's pianissimo. It's so sensitive in Chopin. If it wouldn't have been pianissimo, you might have had the idea of playing it slightly more grand way, like. I don't know. But Chopin is a sensitive guy, so uh, it's more like a vague thought in the back of the head or something, the waltzing. And now we reach the next section. There's a key change to D flat major, which is the enharmonic equivalent to C sharp major. It's just easier to spell D flat major with five flats instead of C sharp major with seven sharps. And Pulento is slower, so before it has been quite a melancholic character. Even the quick spinning wheel is in minor. But now we get the D flat major, we get to enjoy the walls as a consolation for a little bit. There's something going on with the rhythm or the meter of the last part here, and Chopin is playing with the hypermeter. So let's talk about hypermeter. The normal meter is in triple time. You feel one, two, three on each bar. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. But the hypermeter is if you take several bars and combine them to one unit. So here it's pretty obvious that two bars form one unit, and it's because the, we have these ties over the bar lines and there's a lack of bass notes on every other bar. So uh, we feel the hypermeter as uh, one, two, three, 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 one, two
Pretty uh, easy and natural to feel it like that. I mean, this is not exactly specified in the score, whatever hypermeter is. That's the point of hypermeter. But I, I think you can make the case that it's pretty clear in the first section. But then what happens when we get here? Try to follow the hypermeter. <laughs> So Chopin breaks it in some way and I'm going to give my analysis here to what's going on. So I feel the hypermeter units um, of two bars here, one, two, one, two, but then there's like one bar that's isolated and then it's one, two, one, because these two I feel as one unit where you have A flat in the bass. And then there's the start of a new unit with a D flat major. Uh, so it means there's an odd number of bars here. Like maybe this is part of the previous unit. So there's a unit of three, two, three, one, two. But then the really interesting thing I think is here. Uh, if we feel this as the start of a unit, then Chopin interrupts it in the middle and we get a new start of a new unit. One, two. Because this is the same as in the beginning with the clear two bar phrases. Uh, so let's try to test this analysis by adding an extra bar with an A flat major and see how this feels. That would be natural to dance to, right? But Chopin wants it more interesting, so he plays with this hypermeter. But then, when we get to the, the start again, now we get bass notes on almost all bars. So the second time around, the hypermeter is much less important. It doesn't matter as much because we feel every bar as a waltz bar in three. One, two, three. the bass on each bar. So that's how Chopin gets away with it. Uh, when he comes back it's not as prominent. Also we have this lovely typical Chopin ornament. It's like the melody is supposed to come on the G flat on the one, the first beat, but it gets so caught up in the moment that it comes late. And then the second time it takes another turn, of course, the clear diminished. And the F flat is the minor third to D flat. Uh, so we're going back from major to minor. I'm gonna go back to C sharp minor. In minor. A final note on this section. There are some uh, differences with different additions on some details here. I'm not exactly sure which one is like original or correct. You can hear different in different recordings of uh, the big pianists. But I'm just gonna mention the three that I found and the choices I make here. So the first one is here. Uh, I like to do the dotted rhythm on this. Sometimes it's even quarter notes in the score, but because the second time it's always a dotted rhythm, so I think that gives it more life to the melody, uh, so I choose that. Then just after this, um, sometimes there's an extra bass note, a G flat in the bass here. But I don't do that because that goes against the hypermeter thing, so just leave the ties here instead, if you see a G sharp I think. And finally, this place I like to keep the even quarter notes. Sometimes it says a dotted rhythm here uh, because here you have a upbeat on the next bar so I, 
I feel it more natural to do quarter notes here. Yeah, but in a way, I think the other versions are permissible as well. So now we get a return of the eighth notes. By the way, it's really, I think there's room to do this kind of extrando, start a bit slower and then gradually get up to the Piumasso tempo. And in Swedish, we have a great expression for this, uh, to suck on the caramel for some time. This is repeated exactly the same uh, two times. So if we look at now at the form of the piece, uh, we have these three sections. They come one after each other. First is A, B, C, then we're at B again, and then, then we're gonna get A and B again. So we have this kind of circular form gravitating around the B section, and it acts like a chorus in the piece. I think also Mozart's Turkish Rondo has this same form. But in that piece, the chorus part is shorter, it's a major part, and the episodes are longer and they have like subsections. Uh, but still, it's a little bit similar. There's just one little detail I, I like to do when you get the return of the A section, just in the end of it, you get an extra note to hold in the right hand. The G sharp isn't there the first time, so I think it's nice to add it the second time. Anyway, I will now play this uh, A section and B section when they come to finish the piece. So you get a little bit of the music in the context. Thank you for watching Sonata Secrets. The Patreon shoutout in this episode goes to M. Kroskel.